Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 25th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we focus on some fiscal issues that some are already trying to move front and center for the 2023 legislative session. Second, we discuss a new report from Wood McKenzie on what it will take to be an energy super basin in the coming years and where they see Alaska headed in that context. And third, we focus on some further good news about Conoco's Willow Project. And now, let's join Michael. I want to talk about the weekly top three. The first thing we're going to talk about is some of the emergent issues uh, coming uh, out of the, uh, you know, for the legislative races and, and what things that are going to be really hot button issues for the legislature in the upcoming session. But I did want to get your hot take. And you just gave us a little bit of it here um, on this kind of. I, I, I mean, I would almost say disdainful uh, reaction from some of the campaigns on answering um, these questionnaires. I mean, the public wants to be informed. The public wants to know about certain things. And, uh, you know, the, the, the governor uh, came out and basically said, no, I'm not going to answer you peasants. I'm not going to answer your questions. And then Walker came out, you said, later and did the same thing, uh, basically saying that they weren't going to answer questionnaires. Um, they said that they would do interviews in lieu of that. I mean, I mean, I don't know. They just don't want to go on written record? or I mean, what's your thoughts on this real quickly as we look at the emergent issues coming up? Well, I think there's a couple of things about that. One, the Beacon had gone to, gone to great lengths to sort of crowdsource the questions um, and get input from readers and from, from those who are interested in these sorts of things. Uh, to to develop the question. So it's not the governor and Walker aren't just rejecting questions from uh, th that the editors of the Beacon came up with or rejecting questions that frankly Alaskans came up with. And I find that I find that a little bit troubling. The other thing is I, I just I interviews the governor has got this art down of not really answering questions during interviews. Um, and he sort of slides around and, and goes on to, to different things. It's harder to do that in a questionnaire, and, and questionnaires tend to live on longer. Answers to questionnaires tend to live on longer. So I think, I think the governor's concerned about, and Walker, uh, frankly, are concerned about getting tied down uh, with, more specific, with more specific answers than maybe, uh, maybe they want to. So it's disappointing. I mean, I, I, I look at the questionnaires, and I look at the answers, and I you know, gave a few ideas to the beacon on what uh, what should be included in the questions, and 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 a lot of others did as well. So yeah, uh, it's well, it wasn't just see the answers. To yeah, those. it wasn't just the beacon; it was the ADN one as well. So it wasn't like it was just a single outlet that they said no. They basically said nope, we're not answering any questionnaires. Um, so I mean, it wasn't just just the beacon; it was a, a lot more. So. But like you said, I think part of it is that they just don't want any of that stuff on the more permanent record. Easy to spin stuff when it's like, oh, I misspoke or I did this. But when you write an answer out, it's forever. You know, it's kind of clear there. Well, and, and on a question in an interview, you can you can run the clock out, right? You can talk about sort of you right, know, right. you want to for a while and, and run the clock out on a questionnaire. It's really obvious when you're trying to ignore the question. So it's um, I, I think it's they're, they're just trying to trying to avoid being specific. And I. You know, and it's not just the governor; it's it's Walker as well, who's uh, who's announced that they're not going to respond to the questionnaires. So. Right, right. All right. Well, let's dive into the emergent issues um, for the upcoming, not just the legislative uh, races, but for the actual session. Um, 
We've got a few here, mostly talking about education and teachers and local governments uh, being financed by state government as well. Let's break that down. Well, you can already see the the the, the fiscal questions or the the funding questions starting to develop uh, uh, in the in the press. Uh, uh, the Alaska uh, Beacon uh, picked up by uh, the public media and Alaska public media and others uh, had a headline that says "Weeks from Restarting." Schools across Alaska are struggling to find teachers and goes on and talks about uh, the difficulties not only uh, in the bush, but also in some of the urban areas in finding teachers. And then another headline says almost one in five Alaska state jobs is vacant as agencies struggle to hire uh, and retain uh, employees. And then another headline is uh, in connection with uh, Dunleavy signing a bill uh, uh, to uh, increase uh, the power subsidy. When you dig down through the uh, uh, through the through the article, it says at the end, um, the endowment also funds the 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 PCE endowment also funds community assistance grants and grants for renewable energy projects. Legislators were warned this spring that increasing spending on PCE may mean insufficient funds uh, for uh, the, those other programs. And then goes on with a quote. From Nils Andreasen, the uh, the AML uh, executive director, talking about how uh, uh, we're going to need to address this shortfall, the shortfall, what's now going to be called a shortfall in funds for uh, for local government, as a result of increasing the PCE uh, uh, rates uh, uh, as a result of, of the last legislation. So you sort of take, you sort of start seeing this trend, right? You start seeing uh, teachers are in trouble. We're having trouble retaining teachers, and when you get into the article. Uh, it starts talking about the lack of a retirement plan and how that puts Alaska at a disadvantage compared to other states uh, in attracting and retaining uh, teachers. And it talks about other issues as well, but but the lack of a retirement plan is is one of those. You get over to uh, the, uh, the the one in five employees that we or one in five positions in state government are are uh, are are open. Uh, uh, people were searching for uh, state employees. And again, the article, when you get into the article, is talking about lack of compensation or or non-competitive compensation and lack of a retirement uh, with respect uh, well, to current wanna, employees. I, I want to be real clear on this. They have a retirement plan. It's just a tier four defined contribution plan, and it's not the gold-plated defined benefits program tier one through three that we'd had in the past. And so they're saying, oh, well, now we don't have a retirement. That's bullcrap. You have a retirement plan. It's a defined contribution plan, just like most everybody else in the world has. Just because it's not gold-plated doesn't mean, I mean, that just pisses me off. I'll be honest with you. Well, but they talk about it in terms of not being competitive with other with other states and and the defined uh, 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 contribution plans that other uh, or defined benefit plans that uh, that other states have, and then you get over to you know the the article on the PCE and that and and local government saying that you know the PC the PCE is great uh, glad we did that but now we need more funding in here to cover our grant community grants and. Uh, uh, and our renewable energy projects. So you can see this sort of drum roll picking up uh, and starting to uh, starting to, to to expand about things that that people are going to argue we need to be doing uh, in the next session. You can see candidates, uh, Cliff Grove, for example, picked up on uh, picked up on the lack of state employees and or or the or the open slots and state employees and on the. Uh, uh, and on the uh, uh, teachers and said, oh, we got to we've got to address this. And Andy, Andy Josephson has talked about has talked about those issues as well as I'm as, a, as well as I'm sure other candidates have. So y- y- we're already seeing a building mom- a, a building effort uh, to try to pitch these things as uh, as you know, we're going to need additional state funding as we come into the uh, d- for to cover these uh, deficiencies, cover these uh, lack of competitiveness as we come uh, as we come into the next session. Now I will say this, when I look at other states, they have some of the same issues. It's not it's not as simple as Alaska is standing out as as you know as as, as something It's something not an special. outlier. Right, it's not right, an, outlier. an outlier. Yeah. Uh, uh having trouble attracting employees. Uh it's happening in uh in other states as well. And it's part of the phenomena that we're going through about tight labor markets in general. I mean, you see state employees <clears throat> moving to the private sector or 
people in the private sector not moving to state employment, that back and forth uh, that you normally see, you're seeing that in other states as well. Now, perhaps Alaska has a more, um, we've always had trouble with teachers. I mean, part of, big part of that is the remoteness, but perhaps Alaska is toward the edge, but, I, but this isn't a situation where Alaska is unique and standing alone and other states are you're, you know, in an entirely different, entirely different universe. It's, it's a continuum uh, across, across a, a number of states, if not all the states. So it's not, we're not, we shouldn't swallow hook, line, and sinker. Oh my gosh, we're not competitive. We're going to have to do these things uh, to keep up, with, uh, keep up with the Joneses. We need to look at this in a, in a bigger context is there is there a, an issue going on in, with government in general? Is that a permanent issue or is that a temporary issue? Is the function of the tight labor markets as labor markets uh, loosen up? Are we going to see a, a you know a swing back to the uh, to to traditional uh, to the traditional uh, 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 job movement between between government and the private sector and the traditional ability of state government to attract? Um, it, we shouldn't just hollow, swallow hook, line, and swing, singer, sinker. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, Alaska's got specific problems, and we need to just throw a bunch of money at it to uh, to address those problems. We need to look at it in a much broader context, and we need to not run, as you and I often talk about on this show. We need to not run to the other side of the boat, and all of a sudden, you know, get locked into a bunch of long-term uh, uh, retirement programs or increased compensation programs. If this is a situation that's going to, you know, work itself out uh, in a couple of years, well, and and I think we're also missing this that this may be a great opportunity. I mean, if we have one in five state jobs are vacant and the state's still doing the job that needs to be done, uh, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, shadow positions and things like that, vacant but funded positions. That's been going on in the state for years. I mean, at one point, Tammy Wilson had a count of over two thousand jobs in the state that were funded but not filled and had been filled for quite some time. So we may have an opportunity here maybe to save some money uh, and do some things like that by simply defunding a lot of these positions if the state's still getting the job done. Um, I mean, you know, I look at this and I, I I read this article and I thought this is a lot of uh, the sky is falling kind of stuff, as you said. And it's like a cry for what we really need is a defined benefits program. And that will, of course, attract everybody to us and, of course, lock us in for billions and billions of dollars in unfunded liabilities down the road in the future. Um, I, I refuse to see it that way. I see this as an opportunity to, uh, you know, to cut into, to cut into, to go, cut into government and to make us more efficient by eliminating those positions that aren't filled at this point. Well, it's a, it will be a debate topic, certainly, uh, in the next legislature. Certainly, certainly those in the Southeast, uh, uh, Juneau and elsewhere down in the Southeast, up in Fairbanks around the university, uh, and elsewhere where they have high government employment levels, uh, they see it as a problem uh, and will be pushing for, and they and they see money as the solution to the problem and will be pushing for uh, additional funding for those. I think you're right. I think the counter to that is looking at it as an opportunity for uh, for increased, uh, increased efficiencies, but it's certainly going to be a, an, an issue that comes up uh, in the next legislative cycle. And, uh, and candidates are certainly, uh, it'd, be, it'd be useful uh, for uh, uh, voters to question their candidates about how they feel about those issues going in, because that, those are going to be issues that hit, uh, uh, hit them right out of the gate when they get down to Juno. And, uh, and of course, going back to the PCE um, and that discussion, I mean, this is the problem, um, uh, you know, where we've lost this, we've lost sight of what the PCE was originally supposed to be. It was supposed to be an endowment to help create infrastructure, not to create a subsidy farm for communities where they just continually pay it. I mean, we're supposed to, we were supposed to build some infrastructure to make it cheaper for them, right? I mean, that was the whole point. And now we're using it for things that it, it probably was never really intended for to begin with. And we're crying about it. You're, we're seeing, we're seeing Lyman at work. So few years ago, PCE was building up, building up, building up a surplus. And Lyman and, and you know, people were starting to talk about you know, taking that surplus and using it for, for other things or, or reducing the funding going to PCE. So what Lyman did was expand PCE to include these community assistance programs. programs. And what that did was, you know, bring, bring on board another special interest to help support keeping PCE 
right. uh, uh, going. And we saw that when when Dunleavy tried to defund PCE, we saw the community grant sure uh, uh, community come out to help. Uh, Wait, they help created a de- they created a dependency, and then those people who were dependent came in. I mean, tell me that that oh that would never happen, Brad. They created a dependency, and now they're, so, so now they're defending it. Right. So what's happened now is Lyman got an increase to the PCE as as energy costs have gone up. Lime has gotten an increase to the PCE uh, uh, payments, succeeded in, in doing that for the bush. But the other side of that, uh, now the community assistance side, having, having now tasted the, the, the expanded uh, uh, pot of money there for them, uh, are, are now they're concerned that they're right. going to get squeezed out. So now they're going to push for more funding in it. It, it, it is, it, it, th- this is Lyme and at work. You know, if you study how this is all developed, you can see how Lyman really has developed some of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, pots of money and special interests that that have gone on or, or been developed over. Time. The entire labor market is dorked right now. The state is just using this opportunity to exploit, says Chris on Twitch. I mean, that's my point at this as, as well, because this is a problem that's nationwide, and the the poor, poor, pitiful me, kind of uh, poor mouth uh, retirement thing. I, obviously, it's a hot button thing for me because I've seen this for years. But that is the thing: we have no retirement. That's a bunch of pushwa. They've just got a retirement that they don't like. They want the gold plated tier one. That's what they keep trying to bring back is the tier one retirement, which is full defined benefits, which put us into the hole for twelve billion dollars in unfunded liability before, if you'll recall. Um, and so, I, I just find this to be a whole lot of. Uh, Whining, I think, is what I the word that I'm looking at right now is whining, um, and and uh, yeah, it, it is. It's gonna be it's gonna be tough to be competitive, but uh, that's what's going on these days for every. I mean, everybody is short. The labor market is is in a hot mess. It is a hot mess from COVID. Uh, people rearranging their priorities. People like, but you know, some people just not even wanting to work in their fields anymore. I mean, it was a it's a full on change. Yep. I, I if you watch the national numbers. Uh, un- unemployment or employment numbers are recovering in almost every sector uh, throughout the nation, except for state and local employees. And there's been some people who have dug into uh, dug into uh, uh, those numbers, and and it's as I was trying to say during the during the main segment, the 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 movement back and forth between the private sector and the and the state and local government sector isn't functioning right now. Uh, there's been an outflow from state and local government. I mean, a lot of a lot of people cite the stress of COVID and what state employees came under during COVID and and the you know work from home uh, flexibility of a lot of private sector employees. And there's a there's a bunch of other a uh, bunch of other criteria, a uh, bunch of other factors at work. But it's not it's not working right now. And the question question nationwide is whether it's broken permanently or or it's uh, it's going through a temporary a temporary issue and the, the and the consensus seems to be that it's going through a temporary uh, a temporary glitch um uh, as the employment market generally sort of works through works through the the issues that it has so um i, I just what 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 i would not want to see us do in alaska and i think you're exactly right this may be an opportunity to look at the efficiencies um of of how we uh, employ people in state government but what what we should not do is just run to the other side of the boat and say oh my god the sky is falling we need to do all these things in alaska when in fact this is a nationwide phenomena that's going on alaska is is part of that and we need to consider you know whether as people are considering nationwide whether it's a it's a temporary situation that we should not enter into long-term solutions for you know substantially increasing the, the pay scale, uh, substantially expanding uh, 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 retirement benefits that we should not enter into long-term sol- solutions for because it's just going to be a temporary a temporary uh, uh, glitch that's, that the market's going through. Chris asks, he said, I would add the question, how does 10% inflation fit into all this? Because that's a, so, I mean, in your mind, I think it's a kind of a separate issue, but it isn't. It is an exacerbator. I mean, it does cause even more problems on top of that, Brad. Well, the private market seems to be responding faster. I mean, that's that's another re, uh, uh, reason that that people cite the private market seems to be responding factor faster to uh, wage increases to account for inflation uh, than state and local government does. I suspect we'll hear about that next session uh, as uh, as 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 
the employee unions and, and employees generally argue for uh, uh, pay uh, pay increases on the state side, on the on the government side. Uh, so it factors in uh, that way. Uh, it may factor in uh, other ways as well, but that's that's one uh, factor that people have cited for uh, for this nationwide issue about state and local employees. Of course, the irony of this whole situation is that state employees have been getting bumps and raises and colas and step increases for years, while the rest of the uh, while the rest of the private uh, market has been pretty much stagnant. So, but we'll forget about that. You know, we'll say now that inflation's hit, we've got to get our piece of the pie too. Uh, it's <clears throat> the whole thing I, is infuriating. Yeah, I just don't want us to feel. I I just don't want to feel that this is us to feel that this is an Alaska only Alaska centric problem that we need to solve you know, by just starting to throw money at it. We right. need to look at this. We need to look at this in the bigger context. And candidates, candidates who say, "Oh my gosh, we got to just immediately start doing all this stuff. We got to do defined benefits. We've got to, we've got to expand payroll." And don't talk about it as a national phenomena and a national national issue. Candidates who, uh, who who don't understand that total context, I think, are candidates that you that you may want to be concerned about because I don't think they're thinking about the bigger picture. Give me a quick tease on number two, and I guess number three because we can kind of do them together in the next segment. Give me a, give me a shot here. So number two is uh, there's a there's a new Wood McKenzie study. Wood McKenzie is a great. Uh, 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 industry, oil industry analyst, energy industry analyst. They've come out with a brand, a brand new study talking about the new uh, super energy, energy basins, not just oil basins anymore, but super energy basins and analyzing where they think the oil industry uh, is going and, and where they think there's going to be advantages in terms of attracting investment going forward. Alaska didn't do very well. Uh, in uh, in that ranking, and uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in the second segment. We're continuing now. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three, number two, uh, well, and number three, but number two specifically has to do with the new Woods McKenzie report and what uh, what Alaska, the North Slope's place is in the evolving oil world. Brad, uh, give us uh, some rundown here. So the Wood McKenzie report for those for those who are interested in the oil industry overall and where the oil industry is headed. Uh, the Wood McKenzie Report is an excellent read uh, uh, from that standpoint. It's available on the Wood McKenzie uh, website. Uh, basically, what their thesis is, is the oil industry is evolving into not just oil super centers, super regions, but energy super regions. And, and, they, and they define that difference as an energy super region having the ability to do two things in addition to just pr pr produce oil. One is to run that oil, energize, you know, to run the, the machinery, the equipment, the, the operations to produce that oil with renewable energy, not using hydrocarbon energy to produce that and, and reducing the emissions as a res uh, from, from oil production as a result of that. The second is carbon uh, uh, capture and storage, having carbon capture and storage available so that you can take the carbon that's that's produced, uh, uh, generated in the course of hydrocarbon production, and stick that in the ground and reduce the emissions from uh, oil production that way as well. And they define the new energy super centers or the new separate energy super basins as those that have not only oil production capability, but also have the ability to have renewable energy to run the operations and CCS carbon capture and storage. Uh, to be able to uh, uh, reduce the emissions and, and and capture some of the carbon produced, this is the this is the Wood McKenzie report. Let me read just a little bit of it. Some of the traditional super basins are not well placed for a sustainable future. Their paucity of renewables and limited CCS potential will cause investment to fall and the corporate landscape to shrink, uh, especially under the the 1.5 uh, degree uh, uh, increase scenario. Larger disadvantage examples, disadvantage basin examples include West Siberia, most other R Russian basins, Venezuela, Alaska, and parts of Central Asia. Here, the high cost of renewables and or limited access to these technologies are the main problems. Disadvantage basins face a flight of capital and a product that is harder to sell as co in consumers increasingly shun high carbon options. The leading international oil companies will be among the first investors to leave. Think about uh, BP, 
uh, leaving uh, Prudhoe. Some national oil companies and private firms with less on onerous emissions targets, think Hillcorp, uh, will be may be happy to pick up any opportunities left behind. But the writing is on the wall. All companies must eventually back away from higher carbon resources. Here's the here's the next piece to keep in mind. Host governments may try a different uh, uh, a range of different incentives in a bid to stem the tide. Fiscal terms, regulation, and policy must all work to optimize the integration of upstream CCS and renewables as far as possible. But unless governments can address the underlying issues, they will face growing political and social resistance to any attempts to prolong the life of high carbon basins. So I think I think what this is telling us is, I mean, what it's clearly telling us by, by mentioning Alaska and the Alaska North Slope uh, is that is that we've got a challenge up on the up on the North Slope as the oil industry evolves to focus on these other opportunities, these super basins that have the ability of not only producing oil, but producing it with much lower carbon emissions through the use of renewables to energize their activities and through the use of CCS to 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 get away with uh, or to put away their the hydrocarbon production or the carbon production um, as the oil industry involves in that direction investment will go in that direction and investment uh, will flee uh, uh, the regions that don't have that potential. Um, the Alaska North Slope has historically been found or had had a reputation as being a fairly low carbon emissions uh, operation. But what, what Wood McKenzie is pointing out is other regions that are higher carbon emissions op, uh, uh, regions that have that have ranked behind ANS or Alaska North Slope in that are are focusing on using renewables to generate their uh, their energy for the fields and on CCS to be able to reduce their emissions uh, footprint and and while Alaska is fairly low now re relative to the others as the others use renewables and CCS to lower their carbon footprint Alaska will sort of bounce up to 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 the higher end of the spectrum right and 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 not be viewed as as being attractive for investment as a result of that and we normally we don't have ccs on the north slope right now it's not something that's built into those plans up there we have so we can't recapture natural gas and reinject it into the uh into the basins but we don't have just pure carbon uh uh, uh injection up there there's been a lot of talk about the cook inlet having great ccs potential having great uh uh, uh geologic structures to be able to to do carbon capture and sequestration but but as we know the cook inlet's a long way away from the alaska north slope and to be able to take advantage of that you'd have to run a, a carbon pipeline down from the slope down to down to the cook inlet to be able to uh, to take advantage of that so we don't we have as i say we re-inject natural gas we don't have natural gas flaring problems like they do uh, elsewhere for example permian and 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 uh, and the williston basins uh, but we don't capture. We're, we're not. We don't have the ability, or we haven't developed the ability to have major uh, carbon capture uh, uh, beyond that. Just under three minutes now, we can tackle into number three, which is some good news on Willow. If you can give it to us quickly here. Yep, absolutely. So we've talked about the Willow Project, Conoco's Willow Project. Uh, the challenge has been the BLM, uh, the Bureau of Land Management. The courts bounced back. The environmental impact statement uh, said that. Uh, BLM had to do an additional study. B BLM came up with the additional study. They came up with this new alternative. And what we talked about, I think, on the last segment or the segment before that was whether that alternative was going to be attractive that BLM came up with to meet the court's direction, whether that was going to be attractive enough to Conoco to continue the investment. Good news, Conoco uh, recently came out with an announcement that said the new, this is Conoco speaking, the new alternative, alternative E developed by BLM and cooperating agencies responds to the Alaska District Court order and presents a good path forward, Conoco's words, good path forward for the Willow Project. So the concern about whether or not the BLM sort of reining in the, the, uh, the alternative that had been approved in the last round, reining that in with alternative E, uh, whether that was going to produce an economic project, the good news seems to be that Conoco is signaling uh, that, uh, that they're comfortable with that. And generally speaking, we haven't seen the terms and conditions and the limitations that the BLM may put on it. But generally speaking, it seems that we're still headed in the right direction with the Willow project. That's good news because Willow is one of the one of the two big projects up there that we need to see go forward. 
Uh, final minute here, Brad. I'll let you uh, summate on everything and anything else you got on your mind here, real quick. Well, I think I think the I think the combining two and three. I think we, near term, it looks like Willow's going forward. So near term, that project is going forward. Pika, I continue to be concerned about. We still haven't seen the financing for Pika. Uh, and long term, I think the Wood McKenzie report says that we're that we're Alaska is going to continue to face challenges uh, long term. And we may see we may see the oil industry, like the teachers and others coming in and saying, oh, my gosh, you know, we're going to be challenged. We're going to need some some different financial terms here. So we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. Willow's good news. Pika, if we can find some funding, will be good news. But longer term, we're still uh, still in a challenged environment. I don't think the oil companies are struggling. I think the oil companies are looking for uh, any help that they can get. I mean, these are for-profit entities, and anything they can do to make their facilities or their developments more profitable makes sense to them. And this is just another reason why they can now come to you and say, hey, we need uh, we need a little bit more. We need better deals. If we're going to stick around, we need better deals. Is that Am I reading this right, Brad? You're reading it right, Michael. And I think I think we're going to what Alaska needs to ask if 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 we're approached again about uh, about needing uh, better terms, <laughs> better, better terms, yeah. needing, needing better fiscal terms. We need to be talking about investment. Can you guarantee us? I mean, in, if if we even think about that, can you guarantee long term investment? Because it may be. That, you know, aside from Willow and Pika. We're entering into harvest mode here, which is the gradual decline uh, down uh, uh, down as as Alaska fails to attract additional investment, um, and and you know the gradual uh, uh, fall in uh, in Alaska production. We may be we may be entering that. If we are, that's one thing to think about in fiscal in terms of fiscal terms. If we're if we're gonna you know if we're in decline. Uh, maybe the fiscal terms need to change to allow the state to have have more of the of of, of what's uh, of, of what's being taken in of the revenue. Um, but if we start talking about you know as the as the as the Wood McKenzie study uh, suggests, uh, if in these in these challenged basins, uh, the producers start talking about host governments trying to make life easier, trying to extend the life of the fields, uh, that's going to need to be a hard discussion about show us the money, show us the investment. Show us, show us that you're willing to step up and sort of, you know, run counter to 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 what Wood McKenzie's saying that you're willing to make the investment in, perhaps developing renewables to the extent they can be on the slope, uh, engaging in CCS, uh, finding CCS opportunities to the extent we can uh, can on the slope. Show us that you're willing to to make Alaska one of these super energy basins, one of the 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 uh, the, the, the surviving uh, energy basins. Uh, uh, before we start talking about, or as as we start talking about uh, additional fiscal terms, I, and I think that's, uh, I mean, I think that's important to understand that we can't just be like, oh, let us bend over backwards for you, uh, oil industry, because again, you've been utilizing us as a land bank for years. You know, we have been a stable, geopolitically stable, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, bastion for them for many, many years. And just to look to them and go, well, you know, what have you done for us lately? We need, if we even consider new fiscal terms, we definitely need some concessions that say, okay, well, then you're going to invest in us here. Or there will be ramifications for uh, for what you're doing. Well, and it's not... I mean, if if they're going into harvest mode, that means there's 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 not investment. That means there's there's not uh, uh, additional uh, development going on. They're just going to ride out the revenue, and and frankly, you know, uh, regions that are in harvest mode, governments that are that are that have regions that are in harvest mode, they frankly ramp ramp up the share of revenue that uh, that they take because the because you don't need to maintain fiscal terms that attract additional investment if you're if you've gone into gone into harvest mode. So it's we're, what Wood McKenzie is telling us is we're coming up on a discussion. And I think Alaska needs to understand that we're coming up on that discussion. And I need, and I think we need to think about what kind of discussion, uh, what the kind of discussion that's going to be. If we want to survive, if we want to, you know, uh, uh, be a, be a, con continue to be a, a player in, in terms of one of the surviving energy super basins, uh, if we need to, you know, change things, then we need to make sure that the industry is making the investment necessary for us to be one of those survivor, survivors as an energy super basin. 
Uh, what are you looking at here coming up here, Brad? What What do you keep an eye on? Is this election time? Are you watching the candidates? What's going on here? We got about two and a half minutes. Yeah, I wrote a piece in uh, in the Landmine. My piece last week in the Landmine was uh, the most important fiscal issue uh, the candidates ought to be talking about, and it talks and it talks about how they're going to pay that we're going to go back into deficits. Uh, if you look at the ten year plan, if you look at uh, the effects of, of declining oil prices as the future price future markets tell us we're going to have declining oil prices as you look at the impact of inflation on spending levels. Uh, we're going to go back into deficits in a few years. And the question is, the question is, what it, it, what a candidate what are candidates saying about how they're going to deal with those deficits? Not only not only in terms of the big picture things, but but who's going to pay? How are they going to pay? Uh, for those deficits if they want to maintain government? Is it going to be through additional PFD cuts? Is it going to be through more equitable taxes, more equitable revenue measures? And what I'm really looking at over the course of the campaigns is what people are saying about that issue. And and I'm really trying to dig in to understand uh, how candidates are, are addressing that issue. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Well, it's going to be uh, it's going to be an interesting campaign season. We've had some new candidates uh, here in the last few days. In fact, this week is pretty full of new candidates. I think we have an opportunity here, Brad, to see a full change uh, in the legislature coming forward. Um, I think that there's a lot of frustration with some of the uh, uh, previous incumbencies, and I think that this is a good opportunity for us to do it. Uh, some good challengers all the way across the board. So. We'll see if we can change out some of the players, uh, and if we can do that, maybe we can, one, find efficiencies, like we talked about in number one, with some of these things in state government, and maybe we don't have to look at new revenues in the long run, uh, but we do have to pull the state spending under control if we have any hope of not having to generate new revenues or take a PFD or anything else. Well, Michael, it's it's going to be a challenge. I mean, it's going to be a challenge to uh, to 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 not have to address revenues uh, going forward. When you look at where the oil futures market tells us oil prices are going, when you look at the production curve, when you look at uh, at, uh, at spending levels, I mean, we went through this in 2019. We say that we want to cut spending, but when we when we get up to the to the to the to the crunch point, uh, people don't uh, don't back up the don't back up that mantra. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us. We look forward to talking to you again next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.